podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Bossman, are you there? I'm here. You're here. Okay. On today's episode, we are going to follow up from our recent sales episode and provide some useful, actionable information about how you can make more sales in your business, specifically how you can pitch people. That is cold pitch people or warm pitch people via email. Now, Ian, I know you're you're no stranger to getting lay pitches. I'm skeptical. <laughs> I'm very skeptical. You get a lot of lay pitches in your lay inbox. I don't know. Probably about as many as you do. I get quite a few. There's a lot of asking going on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth taking time to differentiate the types of asks that are successful versus the ones that get the old archive button in the Gmail. We're going to get into this, but the other day I responded to a couple cold pitches that I probably shouldn't have. Oh, no. Like I knew better. Everybody does it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I was like bored or I was just feeling extremely generous that day. And yep, right back in my inbox a couple minutes later, the second ask, the third ask, you know, <laughs> and I was like, man, why did I do that? I received an email the other day that it was like, hey, Dan, I was just reading insert interesting article name. And then here's what happens with these sequences is that they happen over the course of like three or four emails. And like the fourth email is basically like kind of a high pressure tactic to read the email, basically. The reality is, is that in certain niches, these things work. But if your business depends on personal relationships and high level contacts, forget about that junk. We are going to talk about how to make successful outreaches in today's episode. I'm ready. Here we go. All right. So first, what I wanted to do is start on the positive. So this episode is in three parts. First, we're going to talk about some successful pitches that got guests onto this podcast. Then we are going to talk about the types of pitches that we don't like to see and the most common mistakes. And in the third part, we are going to talk about a very simple three-part formula that you can use to create a pitch that is much more likely to succeed. And this could be for all different sorts of things. We've used this formula to ask people to come fly across the world and speak at our events, to ask people for favors, to get onto other podcasts, to get famous people onto this podcast, and so on. Let's break down a good pitch. So this is from Steve from freejazzlessons.com or pianolessonsonline.com. Hey, Dan, Ian, and Jane. I just wanted to drop you a quick note of gratitude. My name is Steve Nixon, and I'm the owner of a jazz education website. I'm a friend of Pat Flynn's, he actually interviewed me on his podcast here, and John Lee Dumas's, link to that interview, and TV anchor Clayton Morris, link to that interview. First off, Steve opens up his note by establishing that he is a respected, successful entrepreneur. That's, you know, he's done some interesting things that important people in the space have taken note of. That's worth doing. And he's basically provided some social proof. Exactly. So I'll continue on with Steve's writing. Anyway, I've been listening to your podcast religiously the last couple of months. I love your interview style, your guests, and your whole approach to building a platform. Simply fantastic. Here's the thing. I mean, I don't know Steve. I think it's worth taking a few minutes to point out what specifically is engaging you or interesting you about the people you're reaching out to. Okay, third paragraph. If you are looking for more guests to interview, I would love to participate. All right, this is pretty straightforward. In the third paragraph, we're getting the ask. And we're going to talk about this in the future, but I do think it's important to be pretty clear about what you want, right? Because if you're unclear about why you're writing, people can be concerned that it could be you know, bigger than what you're asking for. All he's asking for is to get interviewed on our podcast. Cool. I like the clarity there. Freejazzlesson.com and Piano Lessons Online are both full-time businesses. Okay, that's important to us. We built the community from zero to over 60,000 students per month. I think I could provide a unique perspective on building an audience, 
time freedom, motivation, business success, overcoming fear, and lifestyle design that hopefully your audience would enjoy. Okay, third paragraph. Now the final bit. No pressure, of course, but I'd love to contribute. Thanks. Hope you're well. Keep up the fantastic work. Steve Nixon. Here's why I like Steve's pitch. It wasn't some spectacular, crazy, ships passing in the night sort of thing. It was a straightforward ask with a really clear element of relevance. And for me, one of the triggers, and this is, we're going to talk about this later, is both of these businesses are full-time businesses, right? There's a level of legitimacy there that he's pointing to that's really important for the types of interviews we want to do on the show. Which is specific to our show. Yeah. Which is important because Steve has taken the time to understand what we're all about and why his information might be relevant to this show. Yeah. He's saying like, hey, I've paid attention. I've listened to a couple shows. Not only have I listened to a couple shows, I, I kind of understand what you guys are on about. Right. And so these are some of the things that I can contribute along those lines. The other thing I want to mention about Steve's email here, it doesn't really matter if he's coming on the podcast or not. What matters to me is that this is a genuine interaction and there's no tricky business going on. (laughs) (laughs) There's no bait and switch. Yeah. There's no hidden offer. There's no hidden agenda. Like you said, it's very straightforward. And I think these days on the internet, that's really important and actually kind of rare to be so genuine. This is a totally doable email to... We'll post a copy of this email at this podcast episode, tropicalmba.com slash how to pitch. I don't think either of us are saying like, this is a slam dunk for sure. It's going to work. That's not the reality of this sort of marketing for your business. I mean, what I think is interesting about this, you know, you said, you know, we're going to post this up on on the site. It's a very underwhelming email. I mean, you read it and you just think like, this is very underwhelming in a lot of ways, right? There's nothing flashy about this email. Sure. And what's interesting about that is that works for us. Now, I think we can talk a little bit more about what works for other people and knowing your audience, but knowing us is important. When you come to us, when you have an idea, when you want to share something, it's important that you understand how we operate. And Steve has clearly paid attention to how we operate, and it's not flashy. Okay, so let's talk about another pretty standard pitch that worked for us. And what's fascinating about this one, it's similar to the other one in that it's it's just straightforward, straight down the middle. It's not crazy, but it comes from an agency. And anybody who has any kind of platform on the internet knows that agencies, they write horrible pitches all the time. So here's a good agency pitch that I want to point out. This is from Kristen at Moxie Communications Group. And again, we'll post this email, tropicalmba.com slash how to pitch. Okay. So, hey, Dan and Ian, wanted to reach out to see if I could interest you in talking with Amal Sarva, the founder of the newest company setting out to change the real estate industry, Notel. Notel has introduced a headquarters as a service model that finally caters to mid-sized companies looking for their own culture-coded space to work. Okay, so already we're just straight to the point. Break away from the frat-style community of a WeWork. Notel is meant for serious CEOs and serial entrepreneurs to have a space of their own without long-term lease commitments or brokers. So already Kristen is showing that she understands the direction of the show, that she understands what her client's all about. She's not pandering to us, right? And that resonates with me as someone who's reading this pitch. Amal has founded several companies. Okay, now we're going to do some social proof, including Virgin Mobile. And now aside from creating Notel, he advises for many other brands and teaches at Columbia University. Okay. I'm all the savvy businessman who knows exactly how to turn concepts and aspirations into reality. I thought you could be interested in chatting with him about his own business advice for hopeful entrepreneurs and how he has successfully broken into a new market each time. Let me know. We're happy to help. Okay, so we really like this bit about interested in chatting with him, happy to help. It opens up a dialogue. It just isn't pushy and doesn't like opt us into anything specifically. Like one of the problems that can often happen in podcasts is that you can interview someone that cannot go that well. So instead of insisting on an interview, they're offering to chat, which again was one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit later, which there's no cost to this interaction for us, except for a little bit of time to get to know 
her client. And basically just take a look. Take a look. See what's going on over here. And the other interesting thing about this pitch is there's no downside. So, you know, she's not asking me to respond. She's not telling me I have to respond. Look at this party over here. Maybe it's interesting for the podcast. Maybe it's interesting for your life. Maybe it's relevant to somebody else. This is going on. Have a look. Take what you want. Now, Ian, what we're going to do is deconstruct the elements of a quality pitch and how you can just plug and play the elements of your business into that pitch to make your outreaches work better. But before we do that, I think it's worth taking some time to take a look at what doesn't work. And unfortunately, we're going to have to out some nasty characters on this one. Before we get into how to construct your own pitch, I think it's probably worth releasing a little steam. This is my favorite part. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> Let's talk about some characters that we don't want to see in our inbox and pitches. They just won't perform as well as a more intelligently constructed pitch would. And this is important because this is going to become a system in your business that is going to get executed time and time again. And so if you can optimize the way you're pitching, you're going to see a lot more results. I got to say, I love having sponsors for this show. It's allowed us to grow our team and we want to do more with the podcast. So thank you to our sponsors. Today's sponsor deserves thanks, growthninja.com. And I'm going to link up to an episode where you can hear the story of how Growth Ninja started. And what's even cooler is that Growth Ninja has created incredible results for many listeners of this show. Let me read a case study from former guest Russ Perry, the founder of Design Pickle. He said, without a doubt, Facebook ads have been the number one lead generation source for making this work. And he's speaking about their incredible growth. It's working so well that 20% of their current customers came from the Facebook funnel that Growth Ninja set up for them. And the best part is Growth Ninja's pricing is performance-based. So you're not paying a flat rate. You pay when you get profits. So what do you have to lose? Go ahead and check it out. It's growthninja.com. And when you go over there, let them know that the TMBA pod sent you. I want to say this, Dan, as a general rule of thumb before we get into these different personalities of pitching. One of the things that I think is important is a lot of times people don't actually have to pitch themselves these days. So like they have like their VA or they have like some process set up and this process kind of leaks out emails and kind of grabs a percentage of the people. I mean, it's kind of like a percentage game, right? Yeah. It's like, well, I know if I send out a thousand emails, I'm going to get a 2% response and that's like good enough because I only need that amount of people. So really it's just a matter of how big of a list can I find. That to me is, it's a very impersonal way of doing things. And it's also probably not how you're going to get the highest quality. So what I like to imagine when I'm doing these pitches is if I actually had to do them face-to-face, -face, how successful would I be? So another way to say this is like a lot of these pitches are like drive-by pitches, right? You're like someone's driving by in the car and like I'm standing on the sidewalk. They're like, ice cream down the road. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, huh? It's like, take the time, stop the car, explain to me the kind of ice cream. You're going to buy it. <laughs> I'm going to buy it if you explain it to me. So best way I can describe some of these, Dan, and a lot of these characters fit into these is just these drive-by pitches. So it's just take the time to actually understand who you're talking to, I think is my number one rule. Yeah, the downside's real even if you're not seeing it. It's too big of an opportunity here. So let's get it right. So let's not be like the following four characters. The first is Bossy Bob. Bossy Bob is the personality or the copywriting style that is presumptive. This is a style of writing where you tell people what's going to be great. You tell people why it's going to work instead of showing. And the problem with this is when you essentially start bragging about yourself or telling me how my show or my project or my business is going to go, I immediately start to judge that, right? <laughs> like I might ultimately end up agreeing with you, but you don't need to put yourself in a position where you're being judged by someone who doesn't even know you, right? For example, I've got a great guest for you. You're going to love having her on the show. She's so special. She's done so many amazing things. That's telling me about it. Whereas in the example we gave before, these are the shows that she's been on. Take a look for yourself. Right. Let me know what you think about her style. And the other thing about Bossy Bob is Bossy Bob has this amazing confidence. 
that you just don't see anywhere else. Like, again, if I met Bossy Bob in person, I guarantee you wouldn't have this kind of confidence because I've never met anybody with this kind of confidence before. You'd be like, what's up with Bossy Bob? Right. There's some kind of evangelist or something like this. It's like, there's no way you can be this confident about somebody unless you're hiding behind a computer writing emails to anonymous people. Speaking of writing emails to anonymous people, promoting Peter does this. Promoting Peter will write you a pitch that basically suggests how great of a promoter Peter is. And there's some sort of uh, tongue twister somewhere in here. How many pickles can a promoting Peter pick? A lot of them. And he has been on 5,000 other podcasts. And he just wants to be on 5,000 number one. (laughs) And he has three best-selling books. 4X Best Time Seller, Why You Should Help Promote His Book. He's been on all these podcasts He is the most successful and the most interesting man in the world. (laughs) I can't believe that he hasn't been on your podcast yet. Yeah. I just don't think this is the best approach. Here's, I think, the misunderstanding in that. Like, yes, obviously the numbers game might have worked for promoting Peter to date. But the reality is I think promoting Peter is losing a lot of opportunities because the entities that he's pitching don't fundamentally exist to promote things. And maybe they came from a world where that was the case. Understanding your audience is really critical here, and we're going to get to how you can do that in a simple way when we talk about how to create your own pitch. Let's talk about these two more characters, Ian, before real quick. Let's talk about casual carry. Casual carry is so cool, so chill. (laughs) (laughs) Basically, uh, casual carry, get an email from her and says, eh, I don't really know if this is good for you guys. It might not be interesting. Don't worry if it isn't. Love what you do anyways. But uh, yeah, maybe this will work. I'm not sure. <laughs> you're thinking like, huh? What do you, wait, wait, you took the time to write me this email? Just the absolute opposite of the confidence that Bossy Bob and Promoting Peter had. Right. Casual carry is overcorrecting for all the horrible sins that have been <laughs> perpetrated before her. And the problem is, is that I think there's a virtue in just being clear about what you want. And if you don't want anything, if you don't expect anything, it's important to be clear about that as well. And casual carry isn't always clear that they don't want anything, but they're just pretty clear that they're casual. You know what? I know you're a big ice cream fan. I kind of got into the ice cream business, whatever, just around the corner chilling, got my feet up on the steering wheel. Do you guys have those American Jumbo Pops or not? You know? Yeah, I don't know. Got my VA doing the ordering. So no big deal. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Our final character. This is a family show. We're going to have to bleep this one out. This is nasty. This is Circle Jerk Jerry. I got to say it, though, because there is this situation in, in marketing circles where you trade. You trade exposure for exposure. And to me, this is undermining of your core message. If the only reason that you do something for me and I'll do something for you, is there any other way to say it than it's icky? It's a little icky. In some circles, this works very well. And I think that it's just not our circle. Yeah. But in some cases, I think that people are right to do a little circle jerking, meaning you come on my show, I come on your show. Just know if you're in that kind of situation, if you're in that kind of market, that it might work for you. For us, it doesn't work. So how do you know? How do you construct a pitch? Well, we've got a pretty simple three-step process. We're going to call it relevance, respect, and reciprocity. And if you want to hang around with us, we're going to describe to you how this system can work to make successful pitches. You ready to do this, Ian? Yes, sir. That's respect right there, by the way. The idea is, how do you make it simple to create successful pitches repeatably? And how do you get yourself out of the situation where people are automatically deleting or archiving your marketing messages because they don't see value in it, or they think that you're one of the four reprehensible characters that we mentioned above? So it's actually not that difficult. And it doesn't need to take that much time. And we're going to talk about pretty simple, straightforward method. We're going to write down this method at the show notes, tropicalmba.com slash how to pitch. Okay. The first one is understanding relevance. 
And relevance is all about understanding your audience's key triggers. So the first thing you got to ask yourself is what part of their life or business are you intersecting with? Here's an example of this. Like there are a lot of people that see you and me as business people, right? So primarily our interest in life is making successful businesses. But if you ask me to come speak at your conference, that isn't the part of my life that has to do with business, right? My business has nothing to do with speaking at conferences. So if you were intersecting with my life at, hey, I want you to travel somewhere, come to a new city and talk to a new group of people, you have to understand that you're not intersecting with my business so much as you're intersecting with sort of like a travel decision or a personal decision. What you get out of it isn't necessarily what people think you get out of it. Exactly. I think another example that I heard from a presenter the other day is he speaks at conferences. He doesn't need the money. Like there's really no amount of money that makes it worth it. I think a lot of times for people to speak at these conferences, they do it because they love sharing the information. Sure. And because maybe they love traveling to the destination. So it's figuring out what people's triggers are and figuring out why people would want to speak at a conference. So, you know, a lot of people speak at our conferences because they like the group, they're a part of the group, but you have to figure out exactly why it is someone might want to speak. And for you, I think like a lot of presenters, the payment isn't in the form of dollars. This is a mistake I see all the time. For example, if you want to get on the podcast some people would think that they're intersecting with our business life, but they're actually more intersecting with our art life. If you wanted to intersect with our business life, you'd talk to us about our sales page or our email funnels. There's a subtle distinction there that it's going to be important to constructing your pitch. Okay. So the first step to relevance is figuring out which part of their life or business you're intersecting with. The second part is asking yourself, what's the trigger there? If you click the wrong one, this is where pitches really sound hollow. So Common triggers would be money, marketing or promotion would be one, prestige, helping or networking, fun is a very much undervalued one, fun, everybody wants to have fun, and art. So a common misconception with TMBA podcasts, for example, is that people think the aim of the project would be to get the maximum amount of people to listen or to get the maximum amount of money, whereas what TMBA is trying to do is actually create a good show. So Pitches that come to us and say, hey, I've heard five shows. This one was amazing. I feel that I could contribute to that amazingness in some way, right? That's going to trigger us more than we get a lot of pitches that are like, if you have this person on your show, probably a ton of people are going to listen to it. It's going to be really good for your brand. Exactly. So just to clarify the distinction there, you know, the first person writing in says like, hey, these five podcasts were amazing. Here was the reason why you guys are really upping your interview game or the structure of this is this and this. I used to work for Gimlet. Here's our template that we used for creating amazing interviews, right? We're like, oh, wow, this is really useful to the show. And then the second guy writes in and says, hey, you know, I'm so-and-so. I've done all these different things. I think I would really be great for your show because I can bring my audience over. And like you said, this is tough, Dan, because a lot of people might not know that the show isn't dedicated to tripling every year. It's dedicated to me and you perfecting our craft. This is interesting, though, to look at the part of the sequence, whereas a lot of those people who are trying to get on the show, if they would have changed their relevancy and intersected with, say, our website, and they said, here's what I implemented on my website. If you implement it, your audience would triple. Now, all of a sudden, your pitch has a lot more relevance because you're intersecting at the right moment, right? And you can imagine this with all different kinds of pitches working or not working. Like if the CEO of X company isn't going to actually make money from that speaking gig, then you can't go to them with a money pitch, right? Money can't be an issue in that pitch, but it has to be some other thing like prestige, helping networking, art, or fun, And that dovetails with the final element in relevance, which is asking, what is the key constraint of your target? So for example, a lot of people write into the TNBA and they say, you know, you really have to have this person on the show. They're great. But that's not really the key constraint in our show. It's not finding great people. We have a lot of constraints, but that's not the first one. I'd say the first one is creating great stories. So that's one of the things that people don't understand maybe about this show is it's not necessarily about the person as much as it is about the story. So, you know, somebody could be 
doing some really interesting things in business, but if it doesn't make a good story, it's not going to make it onto the show. Let's go back to how the Amal pitch then worked way back when we read the email from the press agency pitching the no more we work, but now we have these new sorts of collaborative office spaces. There are a lot of people who can write the social proof resume. You know, I founded X company, I did X thing. But the most compelling part of that pitch was actually the one that addressed the constraint, which is, oh my gosh, there's a story happening here. Now all of a sudden, co-working spaces are changing. And now all of a sudden, your pitch is really becoming relevant to the target. Another thing to mention about constraints is different kinds of companies, I think when you're pitching them, especially for like uh, media reasons, a lot of companies, they pay for these kinds of pitches. Like they need these kinds of pitches. They need people to come to them and say, this is the next person that's doing this amazing thing. This show doesn't need that in order to survive. So that distinction is important, right? Like there's certain media outlets that have to have this kind of information to be able to post 20 articles a day. We don't do that on our show. So I think it's just being cognitive of what the organization that you're pitching, what their intentions are and where do they need to get their sources from. Right, so keeping this in mind, another way you can say what is the key constraint is what's rare for your target, okay? Because what's not rare is people in the inbox pitching them stuff. So ask yourself about your product and service. What is rare about what you're offering? And that's ultimately what you should be underlining here in relevance, okay? And what's not rare about what you're doing, but rare to them. So in the case of this podcast, we're using as an example, it's not rare to see qualified people. What's rare is to see interesting stories and to identify them. So let's recap before we get to our next point. Under relevance, so figuring out what part of the life or the business process you are intersecting with, then determining what is the trigger at that intersection, then asking yourself, what would be something rare to present at that intersection? Or what would be the key constraint that your target is experiencing at that intersection? The cool thing is, is that you can draft this email up one time and then repurpose it for many, many different targets. The second step of a great pitch is establishing respect. So the first one is relevance. The second one is respect. And to me, respect is about how can you be alluring and magnetizing versus bright and loud? So that is how can you sort of open up the door to an interaction as opposed to blaring your message to the person that you want to pitch something to? Bright and loud, I think, kind of borders on that disrespect, respect line. But I also think that also borders on the tacky line. And I also think it borders on the desperate line as well. Yeah. You know, not a lot of people in life, business, email, whatever, if they come across braggadocious, like generally speaking, I think there's some kind of confidence issue, some kind of deficiency. Like I'm always a little bit skeptical, you know, like why is this person bragging so much? Like (laughs) most of the people that I know that are successful have other people around them that do the bragging. And this isn't like your PR agency or Like like the hype man. Yeah, but they have a real hype, man. They're like, hey, man, this guy is for real. Like, he's done all this interesting stuff. Like, as soon as the guy that's doing the interesting stuff has to tell you how interesting he is, I start to get real nervous. So let's talk about how to establish respect. There's three simple ways that you can take a look at in your business. The first is to have a key insight. So this is treating them as a peer, not as a subject. The key insight in the email back to Amal's email was that there's a fascinating trend happening that you can know about. And that's enough, right? And now all of a sudden it's not, you're a subject that I'm going to brag to because I either look down to you or look up to you. It's as a peer, as someone who's trying to establish respect and rapport, I'm going to share with you something that's valuable to you. That's the key insight. Because again, the key insight comes directly from step number one, which is understanding the relevance of the message. Second part of respect is no strings attached, no caveats, no friction. Meaning, if you don't take me up on this offer, it's not a big deal. Not a way that we expressed before, which is like, yeah, take it or leave it. Like, I'm kind of indifferent to this. Like, more in the way that here's the information. This could potentially be interesting to you or your audience. I don't need anything. Like, all I want is to share this information with you. I expect nothing in return. Exactly. And that's fundamental respect And this is the sorts of things that you would never do in conversation, but that happen all the time in email. 
I can't tell you how often this happens in my email inbox. Someone has a small ask. Generally speaking, hopefully they have something to give as well. So they give something and then they small ask. Here's a survey. I think it's really relevant. I was feeling generous the other day. I did it. I responded and then came more questions and more asks. And then I just started to get pissed off because you didn't respect me. (laughs) You asked me a simple question and now it's led to five more questions and I'm not getting any value here. It's a good message for the people on the other side of the pitches too, which is that what interaction starts with is likely where it's going to end up. So if people start by asking you questions, by answering the questions, you're likely to just get more questions, right? Again, and can you imagine, Dan, being at the bar and like someone just taking all your time asking you a bunch of questions? Hey, Dan, I know you've started a bunch of businesses and you're a really successful guy. Here's what I want to do. I want to probably not buy you a beer, And I want to sit here for the next half an hour and expect you to answer all my questions for me. And what world does that happen? It happens in email for sure. And I don't know why people are so brazen to think that it's okay. The final way to establish respect is to show appreciation. And this is something that both of our examples did. And this is just about an authentic way to respect what it is that your target has put so much time into. And it's just about a minimum level of effort of appreciating the work that they do. And all of our positive examples have done this. You don't need to go overboard. You don't need to grease them up. You just need to show that you respect their work. So to recap, first, you're going to determine relevance. Second, you're going to create respect. And you're going to do that by having a key insight, having an offer with no strings or caveats or friction. And you're going to do it by showing appreciation when you reach out to people. Now, the final step to a quality pitch is reciprocity. This is something that I thought of when I was speaking with John Logar about sales just a few weeks ago. One of the things he challenged the audience to do is to make an offer that is irresistible or undeniable. And I think all great pitches have this element of there's no downside. This is irresistible. This is undeniable. The first way you can create reciprocity is you can give free time, free money, or free fun. Give away free stuff. Let's define free because this is another one that we get in our inbox all the time, which is like, hey, I'm willing to do free work for you. Here's the things that I can do for free. All I ask not free. Is that you That's oh not, wait. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not free. All I ask is that you do something. No. Free is free. So if you really want to be helpful, don't ask for anything. Just do what's mutually beneficial to us both for free. Yeah, and this is based on the principle of reciprocity, which is that if people do enough things for you, eventually you're gonna feel like you ought to do something for them. Now, if these people don't know you that well and they don't really understand what you're doing and you do something in three sentences in email and then immediately ask for something back, it's just flat out not going to work that well. Again, you wouldn't do it in a conversation. So why are you going to do it in your pitch email? Here's another one, Ian. How about you make your pitch have no need for even a yes? This is something you can consider. Even asking that your target say yes puts a level of friction and cost into the equation. I get this one all the time. Here's the email. It's something like, it might be a good, good pitch. Let's say it, it had relevance. It had hit the right trigger. You know, Dan, I know you're really into reading and ideas. It hit the right respect. Like, you know, I appreciate your work, blah, blah, blah. I'd love to give you a free copy of my upcoming book. And then the email says something like, just hit reply and let me know where to send it to or just hit reply and basically say yes and I'll give you a download link or I'll give you the Amazon code Yep. or I'll hook you up with my publisher. All these. I love these. I mentioned it because I've literally probably received like a hundred of these over the past few years. I'm always thinking to myself, wait a second, wait a second. You wrote this book, right? You're telling me you don't have a copy of it on your desktop right now? (laughs) Did you miss the little paperclip icon on your email? (laughs) Here's the reality is that Those emails are getting 
archived and deleted in this world of, no, I'm not going to reply and like opt into your funnel and tell you yes or talk to your publisher unless you're Stephen King or something. Like if you're a new author trying to get a start, how about just send the book? Now all of a sudden I don't need to say yes. There's no friction. All I need to say is thanks. You gave me something for free. And the likely outcome, if your book is good and if it jives with the audience and things like that, is that you might be mentioned, you might be recognized, you might be brought on the show. But the reality is that takes months to do. So another thing that's worth pointing out in this process is that you don't have to try and sleep with me on the first date. Yeah, It's a long (laughs) game. Send me the book. Don't ask me to opt in. Give me a couple months to read it. And then circle back. You know, it's just like everything has to be instant, right? Well, I also think that people, rightly, they see all the work that they've done. Like I wrote a book or I have this amazing product. And they don't realize that the person that you're pitching sees 50 other pitches that day. So even putting something like respond with a yes puts a cost like for the first interaction and to establish this issue of reciprocity, you're just asking too soon for anything, It's greatly reducing the chances that your pitch works, in my opinion. The other thing that I want to mention, and I do this consciously and subconsciously about these pitches, is like just taking into account the Lindy effect, which is basically the idea that the future life expectancy of something is proportional to their current age, right? So it's like, if you've been around for five years, there's a good chance that you'll be around for another five years. Like the person that just like comes on the block and like writes a book within two months, like eh, there's not a lot of track record there. <laughs> Let's wait this thing out. Let's see how many real Amazon reviews you actually get. Let's see if I actually like the book and then let's talk about it. The final thing to consider when you're putting reciprocity into your pitch is to make sure that there's no guilt. When you ask, just ask firmly, with no strings attached. Again, there's always this temptation when you've sat down and you've constructed this great pitch email to just include like a little bit of a gotcha or a little bit of a, I would really appreciate it if, that sort of thing. And I implore you, particularly the more important the pitch is, the less you do that. You can create meaningful, and guilt probably the wrong word, but If you continue to give to people over the course of time, you're going to create that reciprocity effect. But if you create a sense of guilt in me, like on the first or second interaction, like, man, I think this person's trying to get something out of me. I'm going to get defensive, right? And that's going to backfire. All right. So just to recap how to construct a pitch that works. The first is relevance. What part of your target's life or business are you intersecting with specifically? Are you interacting with their personal life, if that has to do with their travel plans? Are you intersecting with their pocketbook? Are you intersecting with their marketing reach? Where you're intersecting, the second part is what's the key trigger there? Ask what's rare for your target at that point of intersection. That's where your pitch is going to be most effective. The second step is respect. That's how can you be alluring or magnetizing to your audience, to your target. And to do that, you need to have a key insight You need to have no strings attached and you need to show appreciation. Finally, use the principle of reciprocity. How can you make an offer that is irresistible and undeniable? You can give things for free. You can make it such that your target doesn't even need to say yes to accept your offer and make sure that there's no guilt or no strings attached to your pitch. That's it three-step process. We're going to post it at the blog, tropicalmba.com slash how to pitch. And we're going to have some examples of people who've done it well. If you want to post emails or sequences that work for you, we'd love to hear from you. This stuff, it's powerful, man. Going through this stuff, it's like you do it once. And if you can nail your pitch in your target market, you're saying like you're getting a 2% conversion rate to a thousand people. Well, what if we bump that up to eight? How's that going to change your business? And it's just a matter of sitting down once and doing that pitch. Pitching also is synonymous with getting what you want, you know? And maybe more importantly, and what I think that this episode focuses on is getting what you want without leaving wreckage behind you, you know? (laughs) There's so many people out there, big time authors these days that are publishing things online and in books that says like, you know, how to get 100,000 subscribers tomorrow. There's like all this like hackerish stuff going on. 
on the internet now, how to, how to do this fast, how to do this, you know, how do you do it well and how do you sustain friendships and how do you retain integrity? And I think that those are the things that build long lasting businesses that burn nice and slow, which is what I like to see. Right. Because below all this internet stuff is real people. And if you can earn the trust of real people, then they're going to go to work for you over the course of years to help you out and to extend opportunities to you. And that's ultimately what this is all about. It's more than a numbers game. Three or four of those critical conversions, so to speak, could end up being future business partners, people that become mavens for your work, you know, people that join your team, etc. And so these things, they have a potential to be really big. That's right. And it really matters how you treat people during the process. Cool. Well, I feel like I've been treated well by you during this podcast. Mm. Thank you, Bossman. Very nice. Very, very cordial. <laughs> I, London's rubbing off on you. The big city's rubbing off on you. <laughs> Quite. Quite. Bossman, I look forward to talking to you next Thursday morning. And again, if you'd like to join the discussion and check out all the resources for this episode, check out tropicalmba.com slash how to pitch. We'll be back next Thursday morning. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.